the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. Peace talks get started and the costs involved are made clear. Fancy and kosher, funny and Jewish, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Peace talks have begun. Secretary of State John Kerry hosted a Ramadan breakfast dinner with guests including Israeli Justice Minister Tsipi Livni and Palestinian Chief Negotiator Saeb Arakat at the State Department on Monday. It's the first time that Israeli and Palestinian leaders have sat at the same table in nearly three years. President Barack Obama met privately with the negotiators on Thursday. Kerry has said that the talks could last as long as nine months with the goal of reaching a final status agreement. Kerry has said talks will resume in Jerusalem and Ramallah in two weeks. In order to get negotiations started, Israel agreed to release 104 Palestinian prisoners. Israel's cabinet approved the release of the prisoners by a vote of 13 to 7 with two abstentions. The prisoners to be released are Palestinians arrested between 1983 and 1994, many of them for attacking and sometimes killing Israelis. The justification for releasing specifically these prisoners is that they were arrested for crimes committed before the first peace agreement in 1994. The plan is for Israel to release the prisoners in four stages over the coming months as milestones in negotiations are reached. As part of the progress toward talks, the Obama administration has appointed Martin Indyk as the top envoy to the Mideast. Indyk was an ambassador to Israel and assistant secretary of state during the administration of former President Bill Clinton. Within Israel, the opinion of the other side of Palestinian governance was heard almost immediately with a Qassam rocket fired from Gaza into Israel just hours after the peace talks opened. Gaza is controlled by Hamas, which is the hardline opposition party to Fatah, which leads the Palestinian Authority and controls the West Bank. Meanwhile, regarding Jewish communal issues, shocking video was released this week portraying a vigilante attack on an accused child molester, Avraham Manjewitz, a man who posed as a rabbi and psychologist in the ultra-Orthodox community while allegedly molesting dozens of children decades ago. He was indicted on charges of sexual abuse in the 1980s and fled to Israel, which has chosen not to extradite Manjewitz to the United States. Video of a Mondrowitz being followed walking on the street last week captured an episode of vigilante violence as the videographer, whose voice was altered on the video, explains who Mondrowitz is to passersby. Rapist. This guy's a rapist from New York. This guy's a rapist from New York. Moving on, Meredith Gansman followed around a bearded Jewish man recently. He is world-renowned Jewish food expert Gil Marks, and at the Fancy Food Show in New York City, he showed that there's a lot that's both fancy and kosher. Every year, thousands of hungry foodies come to the Fancy Food Show to try food from all over the world that surprisingly is kosher too. You may not know these vendors' names. That's because they're not major American brands, yet. So they come to New York City's annual and massive Fancy Food Show, the world stage of culinary merchandising. Taking me through the miles of munchies was none other than Jewish food expert Gil Marks. Here, what you'll see is a number of, of them, of these booths, many of them you're not surprised, you'll be surprised about, are kosher and the other ones are often new and they will if possible probably go that direction because again it's part of the marketing mm -hmm. to get in the source it's more competitive to be kosher yes it's not kosher and will never be kosher because it's ham right <laughs> but if you're really looking for a kosher pig you can find that here too here it is the kosher pig <laughs> that's that's as close as you're gonna get yeah. no pork in this pig this pink patisserie, or almond paste candy, or marzipan, is most popular with European sweet tooths. Americans don't know from almond paste and marzipan. They just, um, it's a foreign thing. Mm -hmm. But if you look in the Sephardic culture, one of the basics of the confection and pastry mm -hmm. is, is marzipan and not an almond paste. In fact, I had never tried marzipan candy, so pass me a piece. All right. Okay. Not bad, but no replacement for chocolate. And don't be mistaken, just because the food is deemed fancy 
doesn't mean it's pleasing to the palate. I mean, one of the things I discovered walking through here, some of this stuff doesn't taste good. I mean, I spit a couple of things out because even though you charge a lot of money, Right. and you think it's good right. and just because you own a restaurant right. doesn't mean you understand food and know that it's any good just because you own a company doesn't necessarily mean it's right. any good either usually it does mean that you're not going to get all this horrible byproduct mm -hmm. and weird stuff in there hungry for more from the fancy food show tune into the full broadcast version of the week in review Thank you, Meredith. Finally this week, a documentary about the comedy of the Borscht Belt can reintroduce many classic characters. Meredith Gansman has that story. Guys like Red Buttons and Jan Murray, Dick Sean. Jewish parents feed their children certain kinds of food that keep them from moving quick. <laughs> School's out for summer, but not for comedians. This is the time when some of the most famous Jewish comedians left New York for the Catskills and went to school. And joining me today to speak about this era in Jewish entertainment is writer and producer of the new documentary, When Comedy Went to School, Lawrence Richards. Thanks so much for joining me, Lawrence. Thank, thank, thanks so much for inviting me. This is a fun topic, because this is some of our most famous Jewish entertainers and comedians. When, why did you want to focus on the Catskills and the comedy culture within the, uh, the famous Borscht Belt? I think it started with a question, trying to evaluate and analyze why Jewish people are such a small percentage of the overall population, mm -hmm. yet such an enormous percentage of successful, well-known comedians. Mm -hmm. So it was that kind of inquiry that kind of led us to conclude that there was a correlation between vaudeville was dead, expired, clearly there wasn't any television or comedy clubs. So you had this whole generation of young men who wanted to become comedians. At the same time, there was the rise of the Catskill Hotel Complex, mm -hmm. which at one point was the largest resort complex in the world in the 20th century. So it was kind of like a perfect storm. You had all these venues that needed entertainment for their guests, and you had a whole generation that needed an outlet for the developing talents. Mm -hmm. You did say one of the initial questions uh, for this documentary was why in a world where being Jewish uh, means to be a minority, did you have this group and this uh, comedy scene where being Jewish was a common factor between everybody? How do you define what that means. Everybody. <laughs> the Jewish experience in particular for centuries uh, has been one of exclusion, uh, one of trying to assimilate, uh, using humor as a survival tool. For more laughs from when comedy went to school, tune into the full broadcast version of The Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.